following me around. Don't stop on my account. <laughs> no, I'm. It is wonderful to hear people laughing and talking, and uh, we we had Sunday school today. Yeah, there was people all through the building, and uh, uh, now the you know before COVID we were doing two services of Sunday school in between, and then we tried social distance, so we did away with Sunday school, and we did three services, and it's been up and down, and nobody knows what time to come or anything like that. Uh, I got here this morning, and uh, the first service started at 8.45. That's what we were doing 13 months ago. And uh, I, I, I didn't get here till like almost 8.30. I mean, I was running a little bit late. I tried to be here about a half hour before. And uh, I, I got out of my truck, and I'm walking up to the parking lot, and there's lots of cars already here. I thought, man, that is awesome. But as I walked up through the parking lot, I noticed everyone was still sitting in their cars. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my goodness, has something happened in the church? Maybe I should go back to my vehicle, too, <laughs> and sit till whatever's in here, Marvin and Greg get it out. <laughs> But they, they just didn't know what time service started, so they were all just kind of waiting for the preacher to show up. So, <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is good to, today is our first Sunday in 13 months that things have kind of been, air quote, normal. Amen. So, yeah, a, amen. And uh, I, I, want, I want to say this. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. Appreciate that, brother. <laughs> He's got some Pentecostal in him. He's, <laughs> He's going to be all right. Uh, I, I, I know that, that, you know, it's starting to get full, okay? And we appreciate you being here and skipping rows and all that. As we go along, we will probably have to designate one section that you can just kind of sit where you want. And we'll, you know, and, and then everybody else will try to space out. But... Uh, Please, please don't get discouraged if it took you just a minute to find a seat this morning, okay? It's good to see the church full of people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, like I say, this is today we're back to our regular schedule. We're having our traditional service at 8.45 a.m., Sunday school Bible study at 10, and then this uh, uh, at 11 o'clock. And uh, this coming Wednesday, we will be doing prayer meeting here in the church in person at 7 o'clock. Haven't done that in 13 months. So I encourage you to come out for that. It is always, always a blessing. Uh, kind of take what David and I do on Wednesday night, but we're doing it in person. So come out and be a part of that. It'll, it'll really help you get through your week. All right? And, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, you have to sit beside me. Yes. And you have to laugh at all my jokes. <laughs> it's, in our, it's in your contract. Uh, now, so, some of you are wondering, well, Brian, we kind of liked yours and David's program. Well, are you going away? No, we're not going away. We're going to simply move to Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. Not today, but next Sunday. Uh, we'll be on, on the air at 6 p.m. And we have some new stuff we're going to be doing, some interesting stuff. And so I encourage you to tune in for that, and I think you'll really, really be blessed and enjoy it, okay? But thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I want to get into our prayer list. I want to mention some names to you. Please continue to pray for the Burt McCall family, the Tim Jones family. Remember the Wayne Jones family in his passing this week. Uh, Dan Allison, continue to pray for him. Jeff Lauder, uh, EO and Donna. And, you know, it's amazing what you can find out when you go into the men's room at Mount Moriah Baptist Church. <laughs> There's just a plethora of things happening in there. <laughs> Ladies, I'm sorry y'all miss it. But I found out in the men's room, 
okay, just a little while ago, that EO and Donna celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary yesterday. Good stand up, guys. 40 years, that's a big deal. Donna's a good woman. She's a strong woman. No. Uh, amen to them. Uh, continue to pray for Paul Vaughn, Marvin Peterson, uh, Kathy Morgan. How are you doing, sister? Amen. On um, Jackie? On um, Jackie, yeah. <laughs> Keep that thing handy, sister. Uh, Melissa Stepp's mom, uh, Joyce Price, she's in the hospital, not doing well. Would you please pray for Joyce Price? Uh, Karen Bradley's mother, uh, Patricia Price, please continue to pray for her. Brenda Rumpel, she's having some heart issues. Pray for her. Uh, Kathy Ballard, Michael Atkinson's sister, please continue to lift her up in your prayers. How about an unspoken request? Anybody got those? Man, I, I, if, you, if you didn't raise your hand, I'm going to raise mine twice. Amen. If you're able, let's stand up. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. Lord Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his salvation. We thank you for his death, burial, and resurrection. Father, we thank you for our church, for the opportunity to gather together to worship, Lord Father. We praise you. Lord Father, let us, let us never take what we have here for granted. We have seen over the past 13 months how it can be so easily taken away. Father, thank you for letting us come to church today. Lord Father, we pray for anyone and everyone who is sick or suffering from an affliction. Lord Father, I pray for every person in this building. I pray for every person who is watching us on Facebook today. I pray that your richest blessing would just flow out on every one of us, Lord Father. Bring healing to our lives, help to our situations. Answer our prayers, Lord Father, and help us to walk in your will. Lord Father, we pray for those who've lost loved ones in recent days and weeks. Father, we pray that you'd grant to them a strength, a comfort, and a peace that is beyond their comprehension. But Father, most of all, more than anything, we pray that you would save the lost. Lord, those who do not know you in a real and personal way, let today be the day they come to you. Now, Lord Father, please bless our service. Bless our singers. Bless, bless the word that you've given me to preach. Father, Father, just fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me. I'm nothing without you. Lord, as we praise, let us just lift you up. We pray this all in the holy name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Did anybody bring their voice today? I got you some help back here just in case you did. Amen. Let's praise God. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. You know, God is so good. And you know, Eo and I went on the parkway Friday and spent the night up there. And you know, we rode around and we were saying how awesome it is that we have the privilege to live here and not far from the parkway. And how beautiful. God made this place for us to live. It's just awesome. So y'all worship with us. We'll be glad to have the band back next week because it's hard to sing to these uh, whatever it is, YouTube things. So we're ready for the band to be back next week. Yeah.
time to sing it, but it's hard for me. <laughs> so we need, you know, you guys gotta help us because the pretty boy band is not here. <laughs> and yeah, so it's kind of hard. song right now and I know y'all know it so y'all help us sing Deliverance from my enemies. 
hear any amens left in them? Amen. No. Thank you. You know, there was a day, uh, decades ago, before, before most of us were here, that uh, Mount Moriah was an amen church. And then something happened. We got all sophisticated. And uh, I'm, I'm about ready to bring the amen back. <laughs> Are y'all? Uh, time, time is drawing to a close. Now, I, I, I know you're going to preacher. Preachers have been saying that for forever, but... Uh, Every now and again, I turn on the TV. Not often, but every now and again, I turn on the TV and I see what's going on in our world. It ain't long, y'all. He's coming back. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 13. Luke, chapter 24, verse 13. I was, uh, I was in my study this week. And I was preparing a message. I was going in one direction, and, and, and then God uh, took the steering wheel and, and, and started going somewhere else. Anybody ever been there in life? Yeah. And, and uh, I kept telling him, I said, you know, Easter's over. And God's like, Easter's never over. Easter's never over. And, and so as, as I, I, I sat there and I studied the word, and, and, and you know, I'm hard-headed. I'm stubborn. So I kept trying to go in the direction that I felt like I needed to go. After all, I'm the pastor. <laughs> but uh, God, God took me in another place. And so I'm going to follow what God wants me to do. Is that okay this morning? And uh, I'm not going to quite leave Easter yet. Uh, in fact, for the, today and maybe the next week or so, I want us to hang out on the road to Emmaus. Okay? Is that all right with y'all? So say amen. amen. Okay? A, a little background about our scripture first. It, it's the very first Easter. The very first Easter. Jesus has been resurrected. The women have been to the tomb, and they found it empty. The disciples were broken, confused. Everybody that followed Jesus was down, depressed, defeated, discouraged. Holy Week is over, and some of them are leaving Jerusalem. And they're leaving with their chins dragging the ground. They, they feel like all hope is gone. They're their savior, their, the one that was going to save them from Rome. The, the, he, he's, he's, he's been killed, crucified, dead and buried. Later that afternoon, it's a Sunday afternoon, we catch up with two people. Now, we, we're not sure who they are. We know one is named Cleopas. It, it's a guy. He may be with another man. He may be with his wife. We don't know. But there's two people walking home to Emmaus. So let's, let's read about that. Again at verse 13. And behold, two of them, two of the disciples, went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. It means about seven miles. Okay, so they're walking from here to Hendersonville, to give you a little perspective, on their way to their village. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together, as they talked together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. That makes me smile because everybody thinks Jesus is dead. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. That means that supernaturally God has prevented their eyes from recognizing who they're walking with. You with me? Okay, they just, couldn't, they just couldn't tell. I don't know if, you know, if every time they looked at him, 
the sun got in their eyes, or I don't know what it was, but they didn't recognize it was Jesus. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? He walks up to them and says, Hey, what's going on? What you talking about? Now let me tell you something. When Jesus asks us a question, he's not looking for information. Amen? He knows what's going on. He's just trying to see where these people are at. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, now he's going to get a little smart alecky here. Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Says, Dude, where have you been? Have you been under a rock or something? Don't you, don't you know what's been happening in the past week? An innocent man died. I mean, just all kinds of crazy things have happened. And Jesus said unto them, what things? Jesus is just playing with them now. I love this. And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day. They knew on the third day something was supposed to happen. Since these things were done. Now here's my first question before I get into this. Okay? They knew something was going to happen on the third day. Amen? Jesus told them. But they're leaving town anyway. Don't you think that they would have at least booked one more night. <laughs> just one more, just to see what was going on. I mean, that's like leaving a ball game in the top of the ninth inning when the score is tied. Okay? That's what these people, they're just, they're just walking away. Today, I want to talk to you about discouragement. And let, let me go ahead and, and, and say this, uh, because the first service, they didn't believe me, but I want to prove that I can do it. This is a short sermon. <laughs> See, y'all don't believe me either, do you? Everybody say short sermon. We might, we might beat the Methodists to uh, Bay Breeze today. Okay? <laughs> have you ever laid, have you ever laid someone you love to rest in a graveyard? I'm being, I'm being serious now. Have you ever done that? You know that leaving the graveyard is a long, lonely walk, a painful walk. That's where these two disciples are. They're, they're, they're leaving Jerusalem and they're discouraged. Their hope has been destroyed. For three years, Jesus has been preaching and teaching and healing and building all of this up. And it all went away on Friday. It's all gone. No hope. And, and folks, listen, listen to me. Listen to me. It's impossible to live without hope. Do you agree with that? We need something to look forward to. We need something to get us out of bed. I see people who retire, who've worked hard all their lives. They go home and then they die because they have nothing to look forward to. Are, do you understand what I'm saying? These people have lost their hope. S someone said this, man can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for about one second without hope. Again, that's where these two people are. They're without hope. Church, God sent me here this morning to tell you this. 
God always walks with us in our discouragement. God always walks with us in our discouragement. If you take notes, that's worth writing down. I'm going to say it again. God always walks with us in our discouragement. Someone here this morning is discouraged. Someone watching on Facebook right now is discouraged. You're tired. You're fed up. You're frustrated. Something isn't going the way you thought it would or the way it should. You have an unmet expectation in your life. Something or someone has let you down. You're facing something that in your opinion is unwanted, unneeded, and unnecessary. And you're just, you're tired. You're tired of fighting it. You're discouraged. Anybody been there before? You're discouraged. So church, like I said, let's talk about your discouragement today. Do you know what happens when we get discouraged? Anybody know what happens? One word. Nothing. Nothing happens. No, I, I, I'm serious. When, when we get discouraged, we become ineffective. We become unproductive. We shut down. We don't do what we ought to do. Let me be more specific. I'm going to give you three things that we do when we get discouraged. N number one, when we become discouraged, we withdraw. We withdraw. L let's be real. We're in church. Amen. We can tell the truth to each other, right? Okay? When we get discouraged, usually our first reaction is this. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm sick and tired of this stuff. I don't need this. I don't have to put up with it. See ya. Am I telling the truth this morning, church? That's what we want to do. We withdraw. And listen, that's exactly what your enemy, the devil, wants you to do. He wants you to withdraw. He wants you to pull back. He wants you to quit. He wants you to stop trying. He wants you to give up. I talk to people all the time who have given up. Life has become tough, and they just, I'm out. I'm done. They have withdrawn. Satan knows if he can get you discouraged enough, you'll pull away from God, and you'll pull away from each other. You'll pull away from family. You'll just pull away, and that's when you need God and each other the most. Amen? I talk to people again all the time. They'll start missing at church. And, and, and I'll hunt them down. Don't, don't go withdraw. I'll hunt you down. Okay? But I, 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 you know, I catch up with them. I see them somewhere and say, hey, you know, we, we've been missing you. And hope, you know, well, things have been going on. And this is happening and that and, and all that. And I'm like, okay, I understand. But, you know, we should come back. Well, as soon as I get things straightened out, I'll come back. As, as soon as I get everything fixed, then I'll come back. There's a theological term for that kind of thinking. Now, don't be offended when I tell you, but this is a real thing. It's called bass backwards thinking. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Beloved, when your life is falling apart is when you need God and His people the most. That's when you need to be here. Don't wait for things to get right. Don't wait for things to get fixed. You need to be right here, right now. Well, unfortunately, that's what these two disciples were doing. They had no hope. They were discouraged. They were down. So they were like, hey, we're out of town. See you. It's over. Folks, you know what's interesting? I did a little word study this past week. The word Jerusalem means city of promise. Do you know that? Jerusalem, city of promise. While the word Emmaus means city of obscurity. City of obscurity. The whole, this whole account, the road to Emmaus, is about two people walking away from promise to a place of nowhere. And folks, that's what we do when we withdraw, when we get discouraged. We withdraw from God. We withdraw from people. We're going from promise to nowhere. And, and listen, we, we can't be mad at them. They're not the only ones. 
We read in the Bible that most, everybody say most, most, most of Jesus' followers, they gave up. They quit. Church, listen to me this morning. Here's the thing about discouragement. It's highly contagious. Highly contagious. So somebody over here in this section can get down, depressed, discouraged about it. Maybe it's something here at the church. Okay? Just get discouraged, and they'll start talking to everybody in this group, and then, and then it spills over, and it, it starts moving. And before you know it, it's all the way over here to Amy. Everybody in the church is discouraged. And folks, that's not the way Christians are supposed to be. That's more destructive to a Christian than any virus that's out there is being discouraged, ready to quit, wanting to withdraw. Not only do we withdraw, number two, when we become discouraged, we wallow. We wallow. Now see, I, I started talking about that in the first service, and those people looked at me like I was from Mars. Wallow? So I need to put it in English that us Southerners can understand. Some of us waller. <laughs> now, Kurt, you're from Indiana, brother, and we love you. You're one of us, but see, you don't understand waller. Uh, you understand waller. Okay. All right. See, that, that, down here in North Carolina, we don't wallow. We waller. Okay. And, and, you know, we, we, we waller in self-pity when we get discouraged, don't we? Oh, woe is me. Y'all don't know. You have no idea what I've been through, what I'm going through, how bad things are. I'm waller. I've been known to waller a time or two myself. Some years ago, we were having vacation Bible school here at the church, and one of the teachers asked me to come and, and say a few words to their class. And so I went in there, and it was a whole bunch of like uh, six and seven year olds, okay? And so I went in there, and the class hadn't started yet, so I'm just sitting in the, in the floor with them there, and somebody was talking about some kind of boo-boo they had on their hand, and so I felt obliged to join in. And I started complaining about some boo-boo I had, and how it hurt, and how it bothered me, and how when I went to work, and all this, and going on, and all this stuff, and a little old girl looked at me, and then looked around at her classmates and said, somebody needs to call the preacher a wambulance. <laughs> A wambulance. Because I was wham, wham, I was wallering. Anybody ever wallered? When you get discouraged, you're real bad to waller. Well, Helen, this is right, this is right out of camp, ain't it, sister? Wallering. Oh gosh. As these two disciples walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they wallowed. They did. Re read the scripture here. Uh, Jesus was supposed to save them from Roman tyranny. Oh, they're wallowing. They, they put their hope in him. They were wallowing. Jesus had let them down disappointed. They were wallowing. How could he treat them like that? How could he let them down like that? Oh, just, just wallowing. It, it's, it's like they were... Here's what's amazing to me. These two people are walking down the road after everything they experienced. They'd seen the fake trial that happened. They saw how Jesus had been beaten nearly to death, how they nailed him to a cross and hung him up till he died. They're walking down the road on Sunday acting like they're the only ones hurting. It's, it's like they'd forgotten about all the suffering that Jesus had endured. It had become all about them. Beloved, when we wallow... It becomes about us. Amen? I, uh, I have utmost respect and admiration for people. Now, I'm not one of them, so I'll wallow with you. But people who don't wallow. I don't like to put people on a pedestal, but I'm, I'm going to name someone right here who just left us and went to heaven, Miss Virginia Ann Lancaster. I, I, I knew her for 56 years. That's how old I am, all my life. 
And I remember she lost a son when he was in college, got killed in an automobile accident. She lost her husband, lost parents, lost loved ones, went through all, all kinds. Of, I never heard the woman wallow. Never. And in fact, my wife was communicating with her, I think via text message, just a couple days, a few days before Miss Virginia Ann died. This was just some weeks ago. She had a brain tumor. And Tammy sent her a text, hey, Miss Virginia Ann, just love you, checking on you, you know. And Miss Virginia Ann texted her back something, and I don't, I don't know exactly per word what it was, but it was like, I'm doing fine. Everything's good. So excited that Seth and Kayla are engaged in getting married. Like, wow. Wow. Here's a woman who is three or four days away from death. And I think she knew it because she told her son, Gary, her oldest son said, it won't be long. But she didn't walk. Now, beloved, I think that's an example for us. Yes, we're going to get discouraged and we're going to get down. We're even going to get depressed. But it doesn't help when we become self-centered. And, 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 that, and that's what wallowing does. It, it makes us self-pity. Okay? Which always leads to self-centeredness. Maybe we ought to rely on Christ a little bit more. Listen, if you, if you were discouraged today, if you were down, one of the best things you can do is go help somebody else. Stop waiting on someone to come and pat you on the back and let you waller on them. Okay? Go and help somebody else. Maybe even somebody who's got it worse than you do. I'm not trying to belittle your discouragement. I'm not trying to say it doesn't matter because it does. But if you want to heal yourself, <laughs> go to somebody else and try to lift them up and help them and see if it doesn't lift you up out of your discouragement. Amen? That's not even in my notes. That's a free one today. Amen? Now, but now let, me, let me do this. Let me go a little bit further. But, but before I go further, let, let, me, let me say this. We're not bad Christians when we get discouraged. Amen? Everybody gets discouraged. Moses got discouraged. The Apostle Paul got discouraged. Heroes of the giants of the Bible, giants of the faith got discouraged. But here's the point. If we live in constant, woe is me, then maybe we need to reevaluate our faith. Amen? And you probably just thought of somebody who lives in that constant, oh, life is just hard. It's just terrible. I'm just barely making it. Woe is me. Beloved, that, that, that's not a victorious Christian. That's a defeated person. Amen? Let me give you one more. When we become discouraged, we wonder. We wonder. Anybody ever wondered in your discouragement, where's God? Where's God? I have. I've been in situations, I've faced things in my life where I went, who? Where's God? Why, why, why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? Why, why isn't God doing something? In verse 21, that's exactly what Cleopas was wondering. He was going, we trusted in Jesus. He was supposed to help us. He was supposed to save us, but he let us down. And here it is on the third day, and he's not around. Where's God? Wondering. We call that a lack of faith. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer to how we overcome discouragement today. I promised you I'd keep it short. But something happens when you walk down an old dirt road with Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Jesus is about to rock Cleopas' world. Come back next week and you'll see it. It's just now getting ready to get good. Okay? Next week you'll be grinning a little bit more. Cleopas has lost all hope. But he's standing next to the hope of the world. 
Cleopas feels powerless that he's walking with the omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty God. Listen to me, church. Write this down. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. Some of you are discouraged in this room today. Some of you watching on Facebook or YouTube, you're discouraged today. Listen, just because you can't see him doesn't mean he isn't there. I have had situations in my life where I believe that God has done me like he did those two disciples. He, he fixed it so that I couldn't see him in my situation at the time. Because when I got through that situation, then I could glorify God even more. There have been times in my life when I have went through valleys. I have went through hard things. I have suffered loss. And I have thought, man, I'm doing this all by myself. I've wondered where is God? Why isn't he fixing this? And then when I get to the other side of my thing, I look back and I go, he was with me the whole time. He was with me. The whole time. Let me, let me say it again. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not with you. Again, somebody here today, you're hurting, you're down, you're discouraged, and you're wondering where is God? He is right beside you. He has not left you. Sometimes we just don't see it when we're in it. Amen? Amen? Let me end the way I began. God always walks with us in our discouragement. Donna, ladies, come, come, come on up here. Simple question. Simple question for you. Are you on a road to nowhere today? On a road to a mess? Are you down and depressed? Our invitation is simple today. Just real simple, okay? If you're down and you need Jesus, I want you to come down to this altar and lay your burden down. Okay? If you're here today and you need to rededicate your life to Christ, come down to the altar. If you're here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, what are you waiting for? Come down. See me. I will pray with you right now. Let's stand. Father, I pray for your church. I pray for your congregation. I pray, Lord God, that during this time of invitation and reflection, Father, that you would move in your people. That you would bring us closer to you. That you would bring healing to situations. Lord, that you would lift burdens of discouragement. And Lord, Father, give us courage. Give us strength. Give us what we need. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.